Uh, I'm Brian Hunt from XL Fire Protection. I'm here to give you a quick understanding of how the sprinkle system works. Basically, we have two systems. We have a wet and a dry. Um, of course, the dry means uh, it's in a cold area and it's not filled with water, it's filled with air. Um, as you see out here, most of the piping that has um, galvanized piping will, will be considered part of the dry system. Everything on the interior where there is heat will be part of the wet system. The, uh, the dry system needs to be maintained. There's six low point drains throughout this, this area that we'll walk through um, that need to be taken care of. I think at this point here, every two weeks, this will need to be done to each valve. So six of them, um, it'll probably take you about maybe a half an hour total just to get through them. Once we determine how much water that's actually being saved in it, which shouldn't be anything, it's a new system, we can get you down to once a month to check them. So uh, if you want to follow me, we'll, we'll show you where they are. All right, this here is uh, one of the typical drains. Uh, you'll have to have a screwdriver to pull this open. Basically, there's a valve here and a valve here, and I'll show you on that side so we don't have to take this cover off. So there's a total of six of these throughout this lower area, um, and this is number one. And we are located in front of the uh, unisex toilets in locker room five. This is the second one here. We're on the north end of the skating rink. Uh, basically, it's tough to get to. Uh, I guess you'll have to. How will you get there? We'll cut the wire and then pull the wire back. Okay. They'll be cutting an opening to get into this. Um, so this is number two of the six total. Um, I'm not going to open this one because it's too hard to get to, so we'll move on to the next. All right, we're out behind the two penalty boxes. Um, there's two low points here, which is kind of like the center of the ice. Um, once again, they're boxed in. They'll have to be opened with screws, with a screw gun. Um, and uh, also, uh, we have one on the opposite side here. All right, here we have another one. Uh, we have another drum drip in here, and this is a low point drain. Both of these need to be maintained as well. We're still out behind the penalty box. Um, on the next one, I'm gonna show you how to actually drain them. All right, this here is just a typical setup that are inside the white boxes. Normally, this is, this is considered the top valve, so picture this swung down, and that's what you have on the other ones. Um, the top valve should always be open, either three-quarter to all the way. The valve itself, wherever the handle is, is what the valve is. So if it's in line with the piping, it's open. If it's closed, it's closed. This bottom valve, of course, is always closed. When you drain these, you want to shut the top valve. So you're basically eliminating the air that's in the system from running through. All right, basically what happens with these drum drips, the normal position is this is open. So it allows the air to get to this valve. This valve is always closed. Um, when draining these, you basically shut this. You want to make sure the top valve is shut 100% um, going in this direction across from the pipe. And basically, you just want to open this up. You want to open it real slow because you're, you might get water, but for the most part, it's supposed to be air. So, so we have air. All right. And you want to do this probably five times because all you're doing is you're going from there to there, draining it, shutting it, opening it, shutting it. So once again, you want to make sure this is closed when you reopen this one. And you're allowing the air back into here. We're closing it. And you can hear just a little... Okay, if, if you're getting water out of this when you do that, that means that you have to keep running it, keep doing this until all the water is out of the system, um, out of this particular area. So we'll just do one more. That's normal position, we're closing and opening this valve, and that's it. And we close this one and open, and that's the normal position. <clears throat> so keep this closed. This open when you're done with the process. And once again, if you're getting water out of here, continue this process until it's all 100% air. All right, this is the last one. Um, we're here by the, I guess it would be the main entrance, the vestibule. Uh, this is the last one of the six. Um, basically, you have to take screws out again and go through the process that we did on the last one with the valve up top here open. This closed in the normal position when testing closing and opening and when done closing and opening all right we're in the sprinkler room now here basically you have your underground that's the feed from the city coming in 
uh, with these two valves that are used to isolate so that the uh, backflow preventer can be tested by the city usually once a year. Uh, they usually let you know when it needs to be done. They'll just show up. Um, so basically, if I shouldn't say if, if you have a problem, a head that you know that, that was popped off by something physical that you saw, either one of these valves here can just be shut, and that'll shut off the water to the entire system. Um, you'll possibly get an alarm at the panel, but at that point it doesn't matter because you have water flowing. If you don't know what it is, never, ever, ever shut the valves till the fire department gets here. Um, only if you know. If you physically see somebody hit a sprinkler head and you know it's not a fire, at that point there, shut that. The fire department may say no, but for you um, to save money on, on you know, material loss and such. Um, as we move along further here, this is the dry valve, which covers all of the rink area. Um, this is compressor here is what pumps the air. Uh, we'll get a picture of that after. Um, two gauges here. This is the, the air pressure. I'm sorry. This is the water pressure in the system. This is the air pressure. Basically, in a dry valve, you have air pushing down, water pushing up. When the pressure of the air in the system is released, it takes the pressure off the top, and the water fills the system instantly. Um, here is just the wet valve. Uh, basically, it has its own shutoff, but once again, if you have a serious issue, use one of these two, either one. Wet valve takes care of everything in the heated area, boiler rooms, locker rooms, um, and it's normally the black pipe uh, as opposed to the galvy. This particular pipe here is your fire department connection that goes out to the front of the building. Um, if you don't have water in the system, then the fire department may come in, hit their pump, hit their pump truck up to that, and fill the system like that. Uh, this particular valve here is a forward flow test. Basically what that does, make sure you have the proper amount of underground coming through the system. Uh, basically, usually it's done uh, every three years or so during a regular annual inspection. Uh, basically you're opening up that, it sends the water out to the front of the building, and then you can put a pedo on it to determine how much water pressure, how much underground pressure you're getting for the system. And uh, I, I don't know if you can see the compressor over here. This is the air compressor here that runs and feeds the dry system. It keeps the dry system filled um, at approximately 10 to 15 pounds. And basically when that 10 or 15 pounds drops down, the compressor will keep up with it to put it back up. It'll stop at probably 12 pounds. Then if it loses pressure, the compressor will kick back on to get it back up to the 12. Um, the compressor, seeing it's a new system, should not be running that often. Um, if it runs once a day, that's not too bad. Um, if it becomes a problem, then uh, please call your sprinkler contractor and we'll come out and find out what's leaking. But for the most part, it should not run, except for maybe every couple times a day, if even that, maybe once a day. Um, I believe that's it for this section. Uh, these particular pipes here, these three, are all sprinkler. The galvanized, of course, is for the dry system. This black pipe is the one that goes to the fire department connection out to the front of the building. This white covered up insulated pipe is the dry, uh, excuse me, the wet system that feeds that side in there. Right now it has heat tape and insulation on it, and it goes through in this corner, and there is an alarm system set up for it in that room. All right, this right here is the control unit for the heat tape. Um, that's underneath the insulation for the wet system that goes back to the riser. Uh, there is a type of alarm on here. If it gets to a certain temperature, I believe it's 60. Um, it'll do a, a beeping. If that happens there, then it needs to be taken care of, taken a look at, make sure power is to your heat tape and that everything's good. Um, this is the hose valve uh, that's off from the wet system that's inside the uh, main lobby and warming room. There's two of those throughout this, this property. There's also one that I did not show you that's behind the penalty box where those other two valves were. Very similar to this, um, but only you're gonna have the galvanized pipe going to it because it's off the dry system. Um, I know that the rink is closing in the summer times. Uh, it's important when you do come back and get the uh, cold temperatures back in that these six valves are checked at least once a week for the first month to make sure all the water's out of the system. 
Um, as you do it the first time, you know, if you're not getting water, then, you're, then in the second time you're not getting water, then you can go back to your biannual, or biweekly, excuse me. Um, here on the dry system, of course, it's filled with the compressed air. If you're hearing leaks, uh, like a high pitch sound or something like that, it's usually pretty noticeable. Um, that's when you want to contact uh, somebody to take a look at it. Um, there is a low pressure alarm on the dry system that will be going to the panel if there's a problem with the compressor and it loses too much air. Um, if it's not taken care of after the, um, the trouble goes off, the system may trip within a couple hours, um, so it's important to call somebody at that point. Um, inside here where the wet system is, if you have a leak, of course you're just going to get the water stains or whatever at that point there, once again call us at that. <clears throat> so you're not going to see water leaking in this dry system unless the system actually trips. Uh, this right here is called the FDC, the fire department connection. We're here in the front of the building. Uh, if there's a problem with the underground not fulfilling its need for the sprinkler system, the fire department pulls up with a pump truck and hitches up to here. It's also used for a forward flush, which is the valve that I showed you in the sprinkler room that was up high. Uh, for the most part, this doesn't really get used, but it's important to keep the area around it and in front of it clean. Hello, I'm uh, Matt Alberti from Enterprise Equipment Company, the general contractor and project manager that uh, renovated this ice rink. Um, in the past, we already did a training session on the Simcoe chiller system, and we sent out some flash drives on that training session. We'll be doing the same thing here. Um, as you saw, we just did a training on the sprinkler system and what was installed. This training I'm going to explain is on the HVAC system and the automatic temperature controls that was part of that that runs this whole rink. Um, in general, there's an entirely new HVAC system in this building. Nothing that was here prior to this renovation is being reused. It's all entirely new. Um, we've installed a rather expensive dehumidification system outside on a concrete pad in the south side parking lot. That does the um, HVAC for the rink area humidification, um, CO monitoring, uh, dehumidification of the rink, basically the climate control in the rink. For the warming room area that we have here and for the um, adjacent offices, the skate shop, the concession room, the coaches room, the HVAC for that, and it's the only part of the building that has air conditioning, is done through this ceiling hung unit ventilator. Um, there is a hot water coil in this that runs off the boiler heating system, heats up water, and that's the heat uh, to supplement this area that we're in now, the warming room and the adjacent offices. There is additional heat in this because this was not sized to heat the entire area 100%. These unit heaters that you see around the facility here in this warming room are added to supplement that. Those will really run just in the, in the heating season only. Uh, as well as this unit with the coil that's in it. The reason they put this in is, again, it's, it's a split system air conditioning unit. There's a small condensing unit on the roof. So in the summertime, you're going to have air conditioning in this area and this area only. It's the only spot of the area in, in the rink that here that has air conditioning. Um, as far as the thermostatic control, there's, there's one thermostat control here on the wall. This, in fact, is what is controlling this unit here. The Controls of this unit are also interlocked in the heating mode with these unit heaters in this area. So they work in conjunction with the control valves that are above the ceiling and this unit to maintain the heating set point in this area. So it's a function of the ceiling unit to provide heat through the coil and the proper code ventilation for this area and the unit heaters that provide really the bulk of your heat to maintain the space. So one thermostat controls this whole area and the remote offices here. In the manager's office, in the men's and ladies' rooms, um, the coaches' rooms, the bathrooms in the back of shower rooms, which we'll see, the boiler room, there's small pieces of radiation, hot water radiation. Each one of those areas has a th respective thermostat that controls that radiation for those areas. Um, each of the locker rooms, because they're larger areas, have a cabinet unit heater that's exposed at the ceiling. That also has a temperature control valve and a wall-mounted thermostat, much like this, uh, and that controls the heating for each of the individual locker rooms. So it's individual locker room control uh, for heating, 
and there's a ventilation control for all of the locker rooms, which is done, and we'll see in a moment, on the roof through an energy recovery ventilator. Um, that too, like this unit in the ceiling here, has a hot water coil in it, so it's pulling heated boiler water um, into the coil on the roof, and it also heats up to preheat the incoming air from the energy recovery unit. Um, that unit provides the code ventilation that you need for the locker rooms and the shower rooms and bathrooms um, that are in the locker room areas, and that system we'll see a bit more when we go up on the roof. Um, there's one other energy recovery unit similar to the one on the roof, but very much smaller. It's out in the rink area, and that just services only the new ticket booth area that's in the rink. Um, there's also a small piece of electric baseboard in there. Obviously, we can't have hot water out in the rink area. So there's a supplement of electric heat that is installed in the ticket booth as well as this energy recovery ventilator for the ventilation air for whoever would be in that, in that ticket room area. Um, the boiler room, I won't get too much into that because I'll take you in the room and I'll explain more about that, but it's a high efficiency condensing boiler system. And it actually runs out in this room uh, and throughout the rink, there is two zones of heating. There's one zone that does what we would consider the older part of the building, this warming room area, the back locker room, uh, the back um, Zamboni room area, and the boiler room area. For the locker room areas, which we considered the newer construction that was put in in 1988, there's a separate zone that goes out to that part of the building, which is your five locker rooms, the corridor, and the rooftop unit. And that is a separate zone of heating, uh, supply and return piping. But all of that two zones converge back in the boiler room. So essentially, there's only one heating system for the building. There is two zones. There's no zone valves that, that, that isolate those zones. It's just from a control standpoint, it's very different types of control systems. In here, you've got unit heaters and radiation. Out there, you more have an energy recovery unit. So the engineers that designed this project felt that there was a, a, a two different levels of control, so they created two separate heating zones from that but it all stems from one boiler room. Um, so we're in, we're in the coach's room at this point, and this is a typical piece of radiation that was installed. There's about 11 pieces installed throughout the facility. Um, they're all similar in size. Some might be a little bit longer, a little bit shorter. Supply and return piping system that was installed. Um, we also installed a PVC jacketing around all of this piping uh, over the fiberglass insulation. We find that over time, the fiberglass gets torn, ripped, and it becomes a maintenance nightmare. So there's very strong coating that we put over the piping. Uh, inside here is uh, drain valves that are located uh, in each of these. So you come through, we go through a, an isolation valve that you can manually shut off and isolate this radiation, both on the supply and the return. There's a two-way automatic temperature control valve that is in here. And that is interlocked with this sensor here. This is a room sensor um, for areas that you'll see in the bathrooms as well um, and non-public uh, areas. They just put a silver plate and this, this is actually a sensor plate. This senses the room temperature and then will in turn correspond to the control valve and open and close the control valve accordingly to maintain whatever system temperature is set through the automation system um, that we can go into in a little bit later with the computer system. So that basically happens with all of the radiation, has an individual sensor, um, and in the case of the warming room, it's interlocked with the, the, roof, uh, the ceiling unit ventilator. But in most cases, it's just an independent system of a sensor to a control valve to maintain the set point. So we're in the coach's bathroom, and I wanted to show you the fact of the handicap accessibility that was made uh, to this rink area. Um, this coach's bathroom, and then on the other side of this wall is a unisex bathroom. These have been fully handicap accessible with uh, handicap toilets, sinks, and handicap shower stalls. So again, like the HVAC system that is completely new in the building, the plumbing system is the same. All new plumbing fixtures, plumbing piping, uh, and a considerable amount of underground work that you won't see that had to get done uh, to upgrade the system. So we're in a typical locker room. Uh, there's a total of five locker rooms like this. Um, the Again, this is heating only, no air conditioning in any of the locker rooms or the bathrooms. Um, this is a little bit different in that, like what you saw in the main lobby, there is a programmable thermostat that the temperatures can be raised or lowered here. 
We've installed locking, ca uh, locking cabinets around that. Uh, the manager has the key to those and they can program up or down remotely uh, on the computer system or they can do it individually here at the thermostat to raise and lower the set points for the specific locker room. And really how that works is much like the radiation, whatever that thermostat wants this area to be, it responds to a control valve that is up at the ceiling. And this is a ceiling hung cabinet unit heater. Um, it basically just takes air from this space. There's a fan inside there, the return air comes up through it, blows through the coil, heats the coil, and it comes back down into this space. Very simple system. We got these as high up as possible for obvious reasons of hockey sticks and players. Um, and it basically just takes hot water and through that control valve and thermostat just maintains the heat in this space. What you see on the wall up here is an intake and an exhaust. This is the code required ventilation that you have for these locker rooms. I'll show you a little bit more as we walk out the door, but uh, on the roof is that energy recovery ventilator that I talked about with the heating coil in it. That gives you your fresh air. So what this actually does is it takes the exhaust air from each of these locker rooms and the bathrooms. There's a separate return duct system that goes up into that unit. The unit has a heat wheel that turns and it transmits that warm exhaust air or stale air, but it captures that heat. And because of the heat wheel turning, very slow rotation, it transmits that heat to the incoming fresh air. So that fresh air comes through the energy recovery unit. It gets heated more by the coil and then it comes down into this space and comes out as a supply uh, into the room. So it's giving you your code required ventilation in the space as well as preheating the air so that you're not freezing the space out and making this work a lot hotter than it needs to work. Um, and that's typical for all of the locker room areas and the shower rooms that I can show you in a moment here. Um, the other things we put in here in a typical locker room is, is all new lighting. Um, that's controlled from one, uh, two remote switch locations. One is in Adam, the manager's office, and the other one is in the concession room. All the lights come on and come off um, based on one switching location. Uh, if there was an emergency uh, power outage, and we've already had this tested with light meters and the building inspector and uh, city inspectors have come through here with regard to the amount of lumens that are necessary to get people safely out of the building and we're well within code requirements of those. In each of these rooms, one of these lights is an emergency light. That will stay on and that will allow people to egress out of the buildings. Uh, in the rink area, we have uh, emergency lighting all along the common areas um, and then in the main area over the rink, there is 10 rows of three lights, 30 lights total. There is a total of six lights that are on inverters that in turn come on and illuminate the rink to give you the required lighting to get safely out of the arena. So it was a, a fairly sophisticated lighting system that all comes back to one lighting control panel um, that is in the, uh, the corridor between the warming room and the chiller room. Um, Fire alarm system also was entirely upgraded uh, before we took on this project this past June. Last year, the DCR had a separate project to come in to put in a base fire alarm system. So that was the new system. We simply enhanced that system and put in all new devices for the new areas. We interfaced the old devices in accordance with that. That all has been tested by uh, Scott Phelan from the City of Saugus Fire Department as well as Fire Equipment, who was the supplier of the uh, equipment to Anise Electric Company, who was our subcontractor that installed the equipment. Um, currently, we're installing a BDA system. It's a bi-directional antenna system. That's gonna be uh, completed probably within the next month, month and a half. And what that allows is that should there be a fire or a medical emergency in the facility, um, it allows the uh, EMTs or fire department to have radio communication direct with the fire department through their handheld radio systems that they come in with when they're in the facility. The reason that was put in is that this facility for some reason has horrible connection or horrible connectivity to the city of Saugus fire alarm system. The cell phone coverage isn't the best in this rink as, as a lot of people know. So that also became a, a requirement that the city of Saugus and the fire department was looking for and, and DCR stepped up to the plate and has us installing that system as well. 
Um, not many rinks have that, but that is something that's an added specialty and it's a nice facet to have in a facility like this. Um, other than that, electrically, um, I can show you as we go back in the lobby some of the electrical panels that were installed and what we, we have there. So we're in one of the two renovated shower rooms. Um, again, this is as you come down the main car, there's one on the left, one on the right. Um, each of these shower rooms handles two locker rooms and Similar to what you've seen before, there's a piece of radiation in here through another room sensing thermostat that handles this specific area. Uh, this too is tied to the energy recovery unit that is on the roof. So there are ceiling grills here that have supply and return uh, HVAC for the, the, the shower area. Um, these rooms were also made uh, fully handicap accessible. There are two shower stalls here. Um, uh, three total, but two are for uh, general uh, purpose use, and one is a fully handicapped uh, accessible shower um, as necessary for uh, current building codes. And this is typical, again, of, of both sides, both shower rooms that were installed. Uh, one of the things that you, you won't see here, but it was a tremendous expense and a hidden site condition once we did the excavation work to put in this new shower systems, we had found that the sanitary system, an eight inch sanitary main that came out of this building and connects to the sanitary system out in the parking lot and out in the main road, as well as the storm drainage system for roof drainage was completely clogged. Um, the sanitary system and the storm drain system had had previous complaints of backups uh, on heavy rains and such. We found what those problems were. Um, up a number of uh, feet of clay tile pipe was run back in the 60s when the original building was built. Um, back in the 80s when this locker room expansion was done, that clay pi tile pipe was just built over. Uh, that's no longer uh, a, a code issue nowadays. You can't do that. So in the process of finding where these leaks were in the building, we ended up rotting and cleaning out some of the piping only to find that that had to be replaced. So all of this piping, both from a, a, a storm drain system, was replaced from these very rooms all the way to the exterior of the building and to a manhole that is outside. So it's a completely new storm drainage system below grade here that's taking any of the roof water out to this manhole. From a sanitary system, we uh, uh, flushed and cleaned the entire 8-inch main from the car out to the street, as well as the other bathrooms um, and shower rooms that were in the lobby area to this same eight inch main that is in the corridor and underneath these, these shower rooms. Uh, so from that perspective, um, there's a lot of uh, site work that was done and, and behind the scenes type things to make sure that these areas stay this way for years to come. So we're in the main corridor of the locker rooms left and right and the shower rooms. Um, you'll see the screening that you see above our heads. This was installed kind of for obvious reasons. Um, players come through here constantly, hockey sticks, potential vandalism. We wanted to protect all of the expensive equipment that we put up above what you see here, ductwork, lighting, sprinkler systems, um, the BDA system that I mentioned, the bi-directional antenna system with a fire department. There is cabling above here that also senses this area for reception to the fire department. So that's mainly why this was installed in this area. But one thing I wanted to point out that's, that's particular to the HVAC system is on the wall here, there's a gray um, pressure transducer and pressure transmitter that is installed. We've installed two taps on the supply and return piping system. And the function of that transmitter is these taps are installed, quote, two thirds of the way down the piping system from the boiler room where the main supply and return piping emanates from. It senses the pressure downstream here in the system. And based on what that pressure is, it allows the variable speed pumps that are in the, in the boiler room to raise and lower depending on what they need for system pressure to maintain the heating in the space. So as the space becomes satisfied and some of these control valves close down, this pressure sensor senses that and it's able to slow down the pumps. It's an energy saving device with these uh, state-of-the-art variable speed pumps as well as maintaining some um, level of, of energy savings by not running pumps and thus shutting the boilers off sooner and not running propane. 
So this is a, a one system that was installed. There's absolutely no maintenance required to this. It's specifically set and maintained and controlled through the building automation system. So one of the items, and again, because this cabinet heater was recessed high up at the ceiling for obvious uh, vandalism issues, um, we also installed a red protective cover on the toggle switch that turns on and off the power to this unit. Um, for obvious reasons, you could hit that with a hockey stick and shut off the heat in this area. You can't do that with this red switch cover on. So if a service technician has to do some work on this, they can easily cut that wire tie and they can shut that off manually and put a new wire tie on it when they're done. So it's just another means like a protective guard over the thermostat to protect this from somebody arbitrarily shutting off the, the heat in this area. So we're outside the facility here in the parking lot south side of the building. Um, this unit you see behind me is um, a climate by design. It's the actual dehumidification unit that services the whole ice arena and the ice surface area. Um, the large ducts you see here to my right is the main return duct, taking all the air from the rink, comes into the unit, into the top of the unit. There is a filter section. There is similar to the rooftop unit, there is a heat wheel inside this unit that also transmits that heat with the outside air. It travels through the unit through another filter section. There is a propane fired gas burners in here to create the dehumidification necessary for the rink. And then through these doors, there is a fan section and the fan blows out the front of the duct here. And this is a supply duct that goes up into the building. When we walk into the building, I'll show you again where that ductwork goes and how the air is distributed into the rink. Um, we have already done a training session on this unit when this unit was started up. We had the factory uh, startup technician uh, do a training session with um, Adam and uh, his associate Dan Roy from Valley Associates. I was there as well as Patrick Sewell, the uh, clerk of the works for, for DCR. So I won't get into the, the specifics about this, but this is basically maintaining the entire rink. This system is also connected to the building automation system, which you'll be trained on shortly uh, when I'm done speaking. And that also can be uh, maintained as far as raising and lowering set points for humidity, dew point, um, temperature in the rink, and it monitors CO levels and NO levels in the rink. So again, it's a self-contained unit. There is maintenance required on this, and um, preferably, and it's up to Valley, who they may want to retain as a, as a contractor to maintain this. But this is a key component, probably the, one of the most sophisticated components, other than the chiller plant that runs the climate control in the rink itself. And again, it's propane fired. Um, the propane tank used to be above ground, right pretty much where we're standing now. That was way too small for the facility. So these four bollards that you see set up here on the ground are actually to signify the propane tank that is below grade. It's a 2,000 gallon or 1,980 gallon propane tank that was buried. There's a propane line that runs from the, uh, uh, the top of the tank over to the building and you can see the propane line coming up on the building where the green regulator is a first stage gas regulator. That's regulating the propane pressure down to a, a lesser pressure that can be utilized by this uh, CDI unit. Uh, this CDI unit has a secondary regulator built into it to maintain a proper uh, inches of, of water column propane pressure to fire off the gas. The same thing occurs, this, this propane line goes through the rink and into the boiler room where the it, it propane fires the two boilers and the gas water heater, which I'll go into in a moment. So we're just inside the rink, again, at the south end of the uh, parking lot, south end of the rink. And what you can see up high here is the other end of that supply duct work that I explained coming off the dehumidification unit. That square duct comes in and it transitions to a system called um, a fabric duct, uh, maybe duct socks is what some people might have heard this system before. Um, basically, when that unit runs, a, the air coming through the ducts and through this fabric system inflates. It, it, it inflates the duct system so that it, it keeps it taut and the air comes out these small holes that you see on the side of the, uh, of the fabric duct. And it's designed, the way the positioning of these holes is it's basically at four o'clock on the bleacher side 
8 o'clock on this side here, and it diffuses the air away from the rink or the ice surface, but just gets it to spread out and, and come over the ice area to maintain that distribution all the way down the 200 foot long rink. Um, there's one main return grill way up high, and that's the main return that goes back, the air goes back to the unit to be reconditioned and then back into the rink. Um, there are controls on the side here, uh, much like column thermostats, but in essence, that's the CO2 system, the space temperature set, set point, the humidity set point. All those, like the thermostats, can be adjusted manually from here, or they can be done remotely through the building automation system. Um, so those can be adjusted up or down. Right now, we've got the temperature set at about 39, 40 degrees to maintain space in here, humidity at about 38 to 40 percent. Um, Obviously on some degree days, you could see some fog in here, glass fogs up when you get some hotter days outside, but um, that is maintained based on um, the set points of these uh, controls. So we're over now by the uh, Zamboni overhead door and the Zamboni uh, gates leading out into the rink. And on the wall here, you see what we'd call a remote status panel. Uh, this panel, small panel was shipped with the dehumidification unit. So rather than going out to the dehumidification unit and, and, and opening doors and reading what temperatures might be out there or what the system is doing, this is a remote panel that will tell um, the operators what that unit cycle might be in at this point, be it purge, be it the burners are on, whether it's running at a specific temperature or humidity set point. Um, there is also next to it a purge button. You can hit that purge button and that will automatically start the fans, bring on a certain amount of outside air, and not necessarily purge the whole rink, it's not designed to do that, but it's designed to do that in the event that they had a gas-powered Zamboni here and you wanna get some of the, the fumes out of the building a little bit quicker, or if you had for some reason a, a high CO alarm, a bunch of people in here, you know, <coughs> capacity crowd type thing, and you wanna purge the unit and try to get some building to be flushed out a little bit quicker than normal. So you can hit that purge button, that'll send the dehumidification unit into a different cycle that allows it to purge. And again, th those kinds of things can be monitored via the automation system. So we're in the Zamboni room. A um, lot of things happen in this room uh, from the original intended design. Um, brand new Zamboni that Valley Associates uh, has purchased to, to run this ice rink. We've installed a new overhead door, automatic overhead door to get the ice in and out of the rink uh, and the Zamboni in and out of the rink. Um, we've installed a CO detector at the ceiling here to sense, again, if they had a gas-powered Zamboni, which they do not, but if there's any high CO levels in here, this will trigger the fire alarm panel and the red trucks from Saugus Fire would come. Uh, there's a similar CO detector in the boiler room for obvious reasons with the water heater and the propane boilers. And one of the things that we added to this system was an exhaust for this area. Uh, in the past, Saugus Fire Department had complained about with the old design when they would recharge the batteries uh, in the Zamboni. There's an off-gassing process, uh, off-gassing that occurs with the process of charging the batteries. It's like a CO and that would have a tendency to set off these detectors. Um, so what we've done in, in to correct that as best possible is when the operator charges these batteries, we've installed a, an exhaust fan system and on the wall next to the overhead door is a six hour wind up timer. So in essence, when they put the cables on here to charge the batteries, um, I'm sorry, it's not six hour, it's a 12 hour wind up timer. And when they charge the batteries, turns that on, this fan will stay running for 12 hours to completely exhaust this space as the batteries are being charged. And that gives time for the operators to leave at 11 o'clock at night. The fan will still be on when he comes in in the morning to discharge the batteries and the cables. So it seems like that system has worked uh, fairly well. And uh, we hope that the Saugus Fire Department doesn't need to come here anymore like they did in the past. Um, what you see behind us here is really a function of the chiller plant, but it's really related to the domestic water and the plumbing system. In all of the past DCR rink renovations pro projects where, where they renovate the entire rink mechanical and refrigeration systems, part of that waste heat that comes off the compressors 
is salvaged in order to preheat the domestic water so that the water heater in the facility doesn't have to run as much. So what this system is, is a storage tank, a domestic water storage tank. So the city water that comes in for your domestic water for your showers is stored in this tank. And when the compressors are running, there is a pump P7. This pumps water, uh, I'm sorry, glycol, from the compressors through a plate and frame heat exchanger. So this pump is basically taking warm glycol, waste heat from the compressors, pumps it through this heat exchanger. On the other side of this heat exchanger is a domestic water pump. This pump pumps domestic water through the other side of the heat exchanger. So much like the heat wheel on the energy recovery units, this is transferring heat. It's taking the heat from the glycol, transferring it to the city water that goes into this tank. So effectively, you're preheating this tank, and then the water from this tank goes into the makeup water for the get a propane fired water heater. So essentially that water heater is gonna be heating water maybe from 90 degrees and not 40 degrees from the city water coming in. So it's an energy recovering feature. This system runs whenever the chillers are running. Um, if the chillers are not running, the system is off because there's no heat to capture. Um, we've installed a lot of visual pressure gauges, temperature gauges. Um, there's an air separator to purge out any air We've already done that, so it's a closed loop system. That shouldn't have to happen again, but if there's ever service that's done and air gets into the system, you've got an automatic air release device. Um, these valves are all tagged, and there's a valve tagged shot that is in the boiler room and one in the chiller room that explains what the valves are, what they do, and their normal position. On the chart, NO means normally open, NC means normally closed. So. Obviously, we've left them all in the, in the current position. There's one bypass valve up here. So if for some reason this chiller plant went down or there was maintenance, you can simply open this valve and that isolates this system from the building system and then you're still gonna have domestic water to be heated through the, the, the conventional hot water heater uh, via propane. So it's really a, a, a good heat source to capture that heat, but it also is a redundant system to the propane system that was installed. So we're in the boiler room. Uh, this boiler room is physically located adjacent to the Zamboni room, and on the other side is the chiller room uh, with the chiller mechanical equipment. A lot of things happen in here. Again, it's an entirely brand new room. Um, what you see here is a, is a lock and var propane fired um, uh, water heater uh, that handles all of the hot, domestic hot water for the showers, for the toilets. Um, for hand sinks and for the concession room um, if, if, as need be. Uh, as I said, this is the system outside in the Zamboni room through the chiller system is a preheat to this unit here. So we're preheating again that water so that this guy doesn't work as hot as it needs to to maintain the domestic water. From a heating standpoint, we've installed two lock and valve boilers. Uh, these are high efficiency condensing boilers. Uh, it's called sealed combustion. There is a sealed combustion from the roof, a sealed air intake pipe that comes into each boiler, and then a sealed exhaust pipe that goes off of each boiler up through the roof. So there's no vents, there's no combustion air that's in the room like there was with the old system. Um, these boilers are 96% are, are efficient, and one of the things that is a maintenance issue, and it's it stated on these, is because these are condensing boilers, um, they have a tendency to, to drip condensate when they're running. That condensate has to go through a limestone neutralizer, a condensate neutralizer. There's one per boiler, and then it, 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 it deneutralizes the corrosiveness from the condensing portion of the boiler, which allows you to be able to put that condensate down through a regular floor drain. Um, I've written down the install dates of these, which was October 25th of uh, 2021 when we put these online. These need to be maintained and potentially once a year replaced depending on the use and, and how much of a use. My indication is, uh, is, is my advice would be to replace these once a year. Uh, there's a name tag on it as far as where you can get these from a local supplier, FW Webb, who sold us these boilers. They have these in stock. It's a relatively easy installation to replace these. Um, 
that will just prevent corrosiveness and corrosive condensate from going into your storm drain system or your sanitary system and causing havoc with the sanitary system. Um, in addition, um, the only thing that did exist here is the old water meter. Um, the water main comes in through the chiller room, comes through the chiller room into this boiler room here, and it's basically that top line that says domestic cold water. That comes down, and what we actually found, and, and through uh, a change request from DCR, this is a pressure reducing valve. We found that there was no pressure reducing valve in this building to begin with, and what we found when we put the system online is there were spikes where the city water pressure from Saugus would get up as high as 90 to 100 pounds, and it was creating havoc, it was blowing relief valves as such. So with that, we installed a pressure reducing valve, a regulating valve that we can regulate the water pressure down to whatever the required uh, pressure is to maintain the system. Right now it's about 70 pounds um, that's, um, that's coming into the, into the pressure reducing valve here for the heating system. This reduces it further down to about 20 PSI. You only need 20 PSI out in the building to run what we're doing in the building. Um, so water meter exists, new, new main pressure reducing valve for the entire building, and then a secondary pressure reducing valve just for the heating system. Uh, we installed a new backflow preventer here. This backflow preventer is by code required as a cross connection device so we don't contaminate the domestic water system with the boiler system, or the boiler system with the domestic water system. Um, this is a domestic water recirculation pump. Um, this was installed so that when you go to any of the faucets in the building, hot water, you're going to have instant hot water as opposed to waiting two or three minutes for the hot water to get to your, your sink or your faucet. So this is powered 24-7. It's a variable speed pump. So again, the amount of usage of power is very, very low uh, as it relates to yearly operation. But it allows to have that constant hot water feed wherever you might be within the rink. Um, as far as the pumping systems, uh, what you see above head here is two main pumps. Um, you might have mentioned, remember when I first started the explanation that this heating system has two zones, one for the old portion of the building, one for the locker room. Those two zones con converge back in this building, in this boiler room here, into one common zone or one common supply main and return main. So basically what it does is the heating return comes back through these walls from both of the zones. There's one common return water line which we've tagged. That comes off and return water goes into both of these boilers simultaneously. Depending on the load, these boilers would lead lag. This is the leader boiler. This is a member one boiler or a lag boiler. These can be rotated through the automation system. You can rotate them weekly, monthly, and make this the lead boiler, that the lag boiler for equal runtime. And essentially what this does is this maintains a set point of whatever we want to have that set point for the domestic water system, uh, or for the heating system rather. That set point is automatically programmed adjustable through a hot water reset system whereby the outside temperature, if it's 60, 70 degrees outside, uh, and you still need some heat in the area, you may run water temperatures at only 120 out to the building because you don't need that hot water to, to heat the building. So that's all done through the building automation system, which we'll explain shortly. Um, these are variable speed pumps. So as I said uh, before, in that pressure reducing transmitter station that you saw in the corridor near the locker rooms, as those control valves wind down, that senses the pressure difference. It also slows the pumps down and it opens up a pressure differential valve here so that it bypasses water right back to these boilers. It's an energy saving device that was put on. Um, these are pressure transducers that actually cycle these pumps on and on and can give an alarm signal if one of these pumps should fail to the building automation system. Um, this boiler room obviously has a CO detector it has uh, fire alarm pull stations outside, panic bars on either side of the doors to get somebody safely out of this, one emergency light in here that illuminates this entire room should the power go out. Uh, we've installed the state approved, the state uh, ch um, boiler inspector has been through here, approved this as well as the state plumbing inspector. These are the boiler tags that were issued for these boilers that they're safe to operate. 
These have to be maintained yearly by uh, the rink managers and the people that are operating the rink. Similar with the chiller system, that has to be inspected um, uh, annually. Um, there's a chemical shot feeder here. Um, everything that is in this system is not just water. There's a, a glycol, ethylene, a propylene glycol in this system. Because we have an exposed water coil that's on the roof in an engine recovery unit, we just can't have city water going through that and, and water, it has to be protected. So there is a, a roughly a 35% mix of propylene glycol and water, which gives you freeze protections down to about five degrees at this point. It can go as low as minus one, depending on the concentration of what we keep in here. We, our contract with DCR is to provide a chemical treatment company to come out here once a month to maintain the glycol level and, and checking on, the, on the, the chemicals that are in this system to maintain the integrity of this glycol system. They also do the same thing for the cooling tower and the glycol that's in the chiller plant. Those reports are issued. We send them out for our first one-year warranty period. Beyond that, it's required by the, um, uh, the building managers that are running the rink to maintain that same level of quality with the chemical treatment system here and the chemical treatment system in the boiler room uh, and the chiller room. So with that, um, the only other thing that is a, is a very important part of it, and I'll turn it over to Mike Dolan from um, Alberio Energy. Um, Alber Alberio Energy was our partner here at the, in, in the rink where they had installed a complete uh, DDC system, direct digital control system throughout the rink. Uh, this is the main control panel in the boiler room here. There are no other control panels located out in the building. This is the main control panel where everything happens. There are some remote panels above the ceilings. There's absolutely no maintenance required to those panels. Those are simply just uh, points where relays may have been installed, different transmitters that are all gonna feed back to this location here. But the reportability and what is happening in the entire HVAC system can be mo uh, monitored remotely from the manager's office via a computer and a laptop that we've set up. That's how they can access the system and maintain set points, change set points, know what each individual area of the building is doing for set points, um, and, and any other programming that would need to be done would be done from, a, from the laptop uh, that we've set up or the computer that we've set up in the manager's office. Um, this is connected through an ethernet system, so remotely it can be dialed in, so you don't have to be here at the rink to know what's happening in the system. You can view that, you can change set points, you can troubleshoot the system remotely uh, should there be a call. Uh, there's different alarm settings, and again, I won't get into that. Mike will, will discuss that in a moment with regard to the capabilities of that building automation system and what it can and can't do for both alarming and remote access. So this is a very important part of the system. Um, it basically runs, and it, it's, the, it's the brains of the system that, that integrates all of the things that I've explained to you and walked around, all the different uh, terminal equipment that's out in the buildings, unit heaters, cab heaters, dehumidifier dehumidification equipment throughout the rink. Um, with that, I think we'll adjourn in here and we'll probably go out to the main warming room area and we'll explain more about the actual uh, setup of this ATC system and building management system that's been installed. All right, so first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna open a browser and it really can be any browser. Um, and then you're gonna type in this number here. Um, you're gonna wanna make sure that you use HTTPS um, for secure, because regular HTTP won't work. Um, and that's gonna be 50.214.242.161. And I'll give you, I'll write that down later on. Just wanted it on the camera. And that's gonna be the IP address you use outside the building and everything. Um, this comes up is not secure. It's okay. Just click more information and then just go to the web page. It's just that uh, most web pages don't recognize the local service. Um, so then when you log in, you're going to come here and you're going to type in your username, which we'll set up later. 
hit login, and then you're going to put in the password we set up. And that's going to bring you to your home page. All right, so we'll get started with uh, the hot water system. It's right there at the top. Just click on that, and that's going to bring you to the hot water system page. Um, you got your two lock and var boilers with the pumps for the boilers. These two here, those are the two boiler pumps. Then you're going to have your two sister pumps. Those are the ones that were up on the ceiling. Um, and those are variable speed. They'll come on and maintain a certain pressure in the pipe. Um, and this is what that pressure is here. So it's looking for 5 PSI. And right now we're running at 4.91. And that's going to ramp. And those these pumps here are going to ramp up and down to try to maintain that five PSI set point. Um, then also you've got uh, what's called the hot water reset down here. So the way that works is depending on the temperature outside, it's going to change what the temperature um, of the water flowing through the building is. Um, so basically anything below 32 degrees outside temperature it's going to be looking for 160 degree water. And then anything 65 or above, it's going to look for 120 degree water. And it's going to modulate inside that. So right now, so right now with it being uh, 41 degrees outside, it's looking for 151.3 degrees in the in going through the the system, um, and that's pretty much it on that. So, so this doesn't really ever shut down. Uh, this is the the hot water system stays running 24/7 um, in case anything needs hot water. Um, it's going to stay running all the time. So now we'll go to the CUV, which is this unit here. So right now, this is that unit. Fan is on. Cooling is off. And the heat is on, running at 100% at the moment. Uh, these are all your set points here. So you got your two occupied set points, your two unoccupied set points for when you put the building into unoccupied mode. It's still going to try to maintain some heat in the building, heating, or, and in this case, cooling as well, um, if it gets out of range of those two unoccupied set points. And then you've got your, your lockout temperatures, which is based on outside temp. So. Um, Below 50, at 55 degrees or below outside, it's not going to allow it to run any cooling. And the same thing with heat. The heat is anything above, oops, that's the wrong one. Uh, no, I'm sorry, it's just got the cooling lockout. Not the, there's no heating lockout, just the cooling lockout. So anything below 55 degrees, it's not going to allow the cooling to operate. Um, and then you have a minimum damper position because you have to you have to maintain a certain amount of fresh air coming in. So, so with the balancer that was deemed to be 60%, and then the maximum it can go up to you can go it can go full open. And those are you can adjust those if if, if you ever find that you need to. 
Um, this tells you what the actual temperature is set on the stat. So if you play with the, the stat, th this actually tells you what that is set for right here. And then, you know, and just like on the stat, this is the actual temperature. Um, these ones do have um, humidity and CO2. So you can see what your humidity level and what the CO2 level in the space is. And this lets you know what mode it's in. Right now it's in comfort mode, which is the same as being occupied. So uh, just to let you know, you know, in the world of this particular controls, uh, occupied is comfort, unoccupied is economy. Um, any questions about this room here? Um, this would also bring on these if it gets, um, these three work off of this. If, if it gets um, too far out of range, these will come on. It, it tries to use this first, and if after so long it can't keep up, then it'll, it'll try to bring these on. So these really won't run? They're not going to run much. They're, they're, like, they're like a secondary. That one's on its own. That, yeah, we'll... we'll um, so, so that one has its own stat on it, and it's it's its, its own. Okay. Um, so, no questions on this. Okay. So we'll go move to your ERV one, which is the energy recovery unit that's on the roof for your locker rooms. Maybe. Sometimes you got to refresh the page. It's, um, so if you see this here, this is just showing the the crossing of the air across the uh, the box. Um, what that does is it takes outside air and warms it up a little bit, or cools it down depending on the time of year, um, with the air that it's pulling back out of the building. So it it's like a heat it's it's like a heating and cooling exchanger, is what it does. So. Um, but there's quite a bit going on here. Um, just like the other reset for the hot water, um, we did put one in here. It wasn't, wasn't in the drawings, but we put one in anyway. We felt it was uh, necessary um, to control the temperature of the supply air to give you a little bit more when it's cold outside and bring it down to a little bit colder when it's warm outside. So basically when it's um, 65 outside temperature, uh, it's going to be looking for um, uh, 55 degrees. It'll, it'll be looking for 55 degrees when it's 65 outside and, and above. And when it's um, 32 and below, it's going to try to maintain uh, 62 degrees. And then just like the other one, it's going to modulate in between that. So like right now, it's trying to do 60.37 degrees for the supply. And that's going to be indicated right here. This is what your actual supply temp is. So it's, it's right in that range. It's doing 60.55. Um, so this is uh, your freeze protection that's built into the unit. Um, I will have to, one thing I do want to say that this is an integration. We don't do a lot of, uh, we control some set points on it. We don't actually control the unit itself. It's, it's a package unit that um, we're connected to and we can control a few aspects of it. Um, everything else we're getting is just um, points that we're grabbing from its, its controller so we can give you a graphic. Um, so this is your cooling coil for it. Right now it's shown inactive. Um, supply fan is running. Exhaust fan is running. Um, we're giving it, it doesn't really, it's not set up to really use it, um, possibly in unoccupied mode, um, but we're sending it an average of all the temperatures and humidities 
for the locker room. So we pull them all in, average them, and then we send it to the unit so it kind of knows what the average temperature and humidity is in, those, in all those spaces. And that's, and that's what this represents here, is the average of everything. Uh, and this one here is uh, enable, disable for, base, for on, occupied, non-occupied. Uh, its current mode is occupied. And then you have your temperature. So this, this temperature here is actually this temperature here is actually a, uh, is what the supply temp. It, so that's your supply temp. It's not a space temperature. It's what the air that's feeding into the space. So, it, so this unit tries to maintain a certain temperature in the duct before it hits the space. Um, all this unit is doing is it's just taking the air, taking some out, mixing it with some air that comes in to try to temper it, and then it tries to just make it a certain, make the duct air a certain temperature, so nothing else has to work super hard. And it tries to recover some of the temperature. That's, um, oh, and I forgot to show you on the other ones too. Change set points, all you do is you hover over, and you right click, and that'll bring you up some op options, overrides, sets, so, for an override, it'll come up, you can change the override, and then you can make it permanent, or you can drop down, and it gives you options for one minute to three hours, or you can do a custom. And if you do a custom, you, you just put the numbers in here, you click OK, and what that'll do is it'll override it for just that amount of time, and then it'll go back to its normal setting. And all these have have that, so you, where you can do a full set, which it'll just stay there forever, or you can do an override. Um, if you do an override, um, you'll know that it's an override because it'll it'll highlight purple. I can show you that here. Lost the internet connection. I'll do an override. I'll do it for one minute. Change this to 65. And then it highlights purple. And in a minute, because I only did it for one minute, it'll go away and go back to its normal setting. Um, any questions about ER the ERV? No. All right, so and then we have ERV2, which is the one in the ticket booth on, in that back corner, that back corner over there. Um, so this one has a stat that we installed on it with a motion sensor. So, so we set it for local occupancy, and right now it's in standby mode. If somebody was to walk in there and that picked up motion, it would go into full occupied and the, the set point would change to this occupied set point. So right now it's looking for 55 degrees, which is the standby mode. Um, and if you walk in there, that picks up the motion and that will change to, right now I have it set for 60. Uh, that also controls the baseboard heat that's in there. Um, this this uh, heat exchanger basically works the same. Um, the only difference is all there is is just a heater in the duct. Um, there's not really much to do on this one. Um, you, yeah, it's a ticket booth, you know. So um, the fans will run all the time unless you put it into unoccupied. When it's in standby mode, the fans still operate. It just turns the temperature down a little bit. So if you, want, so if you weren't gonna use that room at all, and you, knew, and you know it, 
you can put it into occupy, uh, unoccupied. Um, even if the rest of the building is occupied, you can do it. You can just override it right here. Uh, by doing the same thing, right clicking, you can go down to, uh, you can do an override on it. You can change it to, from local occupancy to unoccupied, and that'll shut the fan and everything off. You save yourself some energy. Um, but otherwise, when it's in local occupancy, it just bounces back and forth between occupied and standby. Um, any other questions? So since we don't really use that room, if I switched it to unoccupied and somebody went in, would it? No, once it's it, yeah. It, to, for the motion sensor to work, it has to be in local occupancy. <laughs> yeah, so for, for this, mo the motion sensor doesn't work unless it's in local occupancy. Um, but in local occupied, the fans continuously run. All right, and this, so that, you good? Okay. So then you have your floor plans. Which kind of just sh what shows you where all of your equipment is, the room numbers. Um, so it has all that. So it, you can, once you're in here, and if you know the room you're looking for, you can just click on it. And that's not supposed to happen. Always allow. So that'll bring up a, a pop-up window. And so that brings up, so a lot of, the, you have a lot of fin tube around the building. Um, they just like what's in your office. Um, so we designate it with this here. Um, this one here doesn't actually have a thermostat. It only, it has a plate sensor on it. So you'll see some of these throughout the building. A lot of them might just be blank plates. Others are actual temperature sensors. Um, if you see one that's in the in a room with a fin tube, more than likely it's a it's a temper it's your temperature sensor for that space. Um, so as you can see, this is in purple. So right now I've got a lot of this. A lot of the building is overridden at 50 degrees because that's where I was told to to leave it for now. Um, so you can see this is this one's designated, you know, FTR for fin, fin tube relay, and uh, room 105. So on those, those are a pop up so you have to close them out with an X, or else they'll just stay up forever. Um, we can check out another one here. So this one's a uh, this one's a, a ceiling mount unit heater. This one's actually the one in the Zamboni room. Uh, unit heater five. Um, as you can see, things are still overridden. But then you just close it out when you when you're done. Those are any questions about the floor plans. You can pretty you can click on any any of these. This just means the red is, means it's in alarm. It just means that it's out of range of the, where we set it. Um, just because the building's cold right now, and I and I've moved some temperatures up, so it takes a while for for everything to recover. So they they may go into alarm when that happens. Is there a reset or just? It'll, once, it, once it gets back in the range, it'll clear as itself. And the range is 10 degrees above or below whatever the set point is. Um, any questions about the floor plans? No? Okay. So then you have uh, your building points, which the building points are really just 
Um, I should rename that, but it has more than just um, So this is, this is all humidifier. I, I'm going to rename that from building points. I don't, I don't like the way my engineer did that. I'm um, going to name it humidifier. Because this is just all the points for the humidifier. There's just too much going on in that to build a graphic, so we just gave you points with, with, with values. Um, there's really not much I can control on that. I can control the occupancy. Unfortunately, they don't give me a actual name. They're a number. Zero is uh, zero is unoccupied, and one is occupied. Um, I, I, I might play with that a little bit and see if I can't fix that for you. Um, it gives you I can adjust the purge time. So, like, if you push that purge button, um, right now it'll purge for ten minutes. Um, that can be adjusted here. Uh, the other one I can adjust is the. Uh, the space heat set point and the space humidity set point. That's it. That's all I can control on that. Um, everything else is just informational, so you can kind of see what's going on. Um, that's, I mean, I don't know a lot about that unit, so I mean, it's, that's just going to be a matter of looking at it, seeing, you know. And obviously, if you have any questions, you know, you can get in contact with us. We can, we can walk over things with you again. Um, any questions about the dehumidifier? So on here, it says the humidity set point is the relative humidity. Yep, so, that's, so this one here, is the, it's the space humidity. So right now, the space humidity is set for 38%. So it's below 38% right now. It's 20. It's it's a uh, 29% humidity in the space. So the it's not going to try to he dehumidify right now. Is on the box out there it says dew point, and I think it's similar. Dew point's different. I think it's about the same set point though. It could it, it could be, but I can't I can't adjust the dew point. Dew point uh, dew point is a calculation that takes the the t the space temperature. Oh, okay, you know space temperature. And the humidity does a calculation and spits out a dew point temperature. Yeah, because out there it's dew point. And here it's relevant humidity. Yeah. Out so there it can't be relevant humidity, but I guess I can't on. Here. Yeah. So we see the humidity because that's the what that's what the controller reports to us is relative humidity, uh, the built-in controller. Uh, so this does have dew point on it too. So this here, the DP. 29%. It's, it's actually the same. What's the temperature, space temp? Oh, that's why. They're almost the same because of the cold temperature in the space. Um, anything else? Good. All right, so the next thing we have is your schedules. So if you click on that up there, that'll bring you to your schedule page. So this will tell you, so this is just the schedule name, master schedule. And if you had more than, if, and if, you, if you end up adding more schedules, like if you want certain areas scheduled different than others, we could do that. We could, we could add more schedules and just link just that equipment to different schedules. Right now, is you've got one base master schedule for the whole building. Um, but that can change based on your needs. All right, so right now it's currently occupied. Um, the next change is, is occupied, and it's, gonna, it's, it's, it's at this date and time. Um, I'm sorry, the next change is this and it's going to change to unoccupied. Um, so that just gives you a quick snapshot of what is coming up. But then if you click on the actual master schedule itself, it brings you a pop-up, brings you to the actual schedule page. So there's a couple ways that you can change schedules. You can either change it by changing the numbers here 
or you can click and highlight and drag. And as you drag, if you look, if you see down there, it it changes down there as well. Um, then you can also copy a day. So if you wanna, so you can you can copy the day, and I can come over here and I can and I can paste it there, and it'll change it automatically. Or if it's a Monday through Friday event, I can and I can do uh, apply that date all Monday through Friday, and it will just do all of them. Um, scheduling is pretty straightforward. If you you can also do multiples in the same day. So like I can move this up here, so that say so you had some people in here really early in the morning. You got some here super early in the morning, and then you also wanted to add. Come on, go away. Uh, where is it? So then you can just and drag and make another occupied event. One thing you have to remember to do after any changes, you have to come up here and hit this save, or else it will not it, it won't take it. Because now if I don't save it, I close it out, I go back in. It's back to the way it was. Any questions? Pretty that's, that's pretty much it. It's not a not a huge system here, so a lot going on, but not a huge system. Yeah. Cut, huh? cut, cut. So we're on the roof here at Kasabuski. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned before, there's an energy recovery unit that handles the locker rooms and the um, bathrooms in that space. Uh, this is the Green Heck energy recovery unit that performs that service. Um, there's various components. It's a self-contained air conditioning unit. This is the cooling coil that will do the air conditioning in the summertime. Um, the return air comes up through a duct here, and it either can go through the coil to be cooled, go back this way through an exhaust fan to exhaust the air out. And then the most important part of this energy recovery unit is a heat wheel. As I said, this heat wheel continues to turn and it extracts the warm air that's being exhausted out of the unit and out of the building, transfers that heat to the incoming outside air to preheat it, where it then would go through two sets of filters and through the cooling coil in order to be cooled in the summertime or the heating coil to be heated in the wintertime. Um, these coils are basically, uh, these filters are basically the filters that should be changed every six months at, 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 at minimum maybe more depending on the high traffic areas you got. Uh, 25 by 25 by two inch throwaway filters, very common size, and they just slide, slide in and out and can be disposed of in a regular dumpster. Um, so I'm gonna close up these panels here. And again, this is the exhaust fan. As I said, the air comes up, would it be exhausted out? or it can be put back into the building um, once we uh, preheat the air um, from the coming in from the outside air. The supply fan section is this section here. So again, as the air is, is cooled, it will go through a supply fan section discharges vertically down through the supply duct system that goes into the building and the locker rooms and into the uh, shower rooms. The heating portion um, for the times like today in the, in the winter mode, there is a heating coil in here. Again, it's part of the heating system in the building. It's fed off of the boilers that we saw earlier in the presentation. And the two pipes come up through the, through
through the roof into this roof curb. I'll show you at the other end of the unit here in a moment where those come up. But they basically go through a horizontal heating coil here. That temperature is being maintained to only discharge to about maintaining 50 degrees in the space. We don't want to really heat this up to 90, 100 degrees the discharge temperature because that's what the units are in the locker rooms and the radiation. That does the final heating. This is really to temper the air that you're bringing in for ventilation purposes and to get the, the, the discharge temperature at about 50 to 60 degrees going into the building. The unit also has a main disconnect switch here in emergencies. They could shut that off as a serviceman switch. And then there's also two local switches. One does uh, main power to the unit. This one also does um, a service outlet that's inside here for a serviceman that would come up to work. There's actually a service plug that stays live all the time that we can utilize that uh, for service capabilities. There's lighting that's inside these, um, and that also will illuminate uh, in the nighttime should there be service necessary in the nighttime. So we're at the end of the unit here. Um, these two pipes that you see are the supply and return hot water piping coming from the building and the heating system. Again, it basically comes up, goes through a horizontal coil, and then back down into the uh, return system in the building. Um, because this is located on the roof, um, this entire heating system in the rink, including this, has glycol in it, uh, about a 35% ethylene glycol mix, so that we don't uh, obviously freeze uh, in this situation in the winter time. So, that has to be maintained during the course of uh, yearly operation to maintain the integrity of that glycol so that it doesn't drop down below a, a certain parameter that uh, uh, could cause some, some problems with freezing in the coil here. Uh, what you see up in, in this area here is basically the main control compartments. Um, this is the single compressor that is running the cooling through that DX coil that you saw on the other side. Um, there's a, a DDC controller here that has been connected to the building automation system from Stellar and uh, Alberio Energy. Uh, and these are uh, starters that are starting the fans um, that uh, control the heating and cooling as well with regard to starting, starting and stopping of the fans. Um, for the most part, there's not a lot of service that needs to be done in this area, but this is where the programming is. and, and the delta controller that is providing the functions of all this, much like a similar delta controller that is in the dehumidification unit on the other side, this is the main, I call it the brains of the system that's allowing this, this unit to run and maintain the system temperatures that we program. That's all patched into the Alberio Energy System as well and they can monitor set points and change settings from that. Uh, this is the convenience outlet for servicemen's tech and as you can see there's a light available in the service compartment as well as some of the other fan compartments in the unit. Um, the cooling, um, there's an, the indoor coil, the DX coil as I said was inside the unit. The condensing portion, this is the condenser coil here and the condenser fans. Um, condenser coil, just washing these coils with a regular garden hose is fine. Um, there's one condenser fan and that just extracts the heat to cool the compressors. That's the functionality of this whole coil here. Um, these hoods here, uh, one is, a, is an outside air intake hood for fresh air and the hoods off the back are the exhaust hoods for exhausting the stale air out of the building as well. Again, through that heat wheel that's extracting that heat and turning it into preheating the outside air, you're also exhausting the stale air out of the building. Um, so that's about it for this energy recovery unit. There's a couple of more things that I'll show you just visually from here as the camera would pan down on the main part of the roof. So among the other things that we installed here on the roof is, uh, if you remember in the main lobby, there was that combination heating air conditioning unit in the ceiling. This is the condensing unit that is uh, piped and wired directly to that indoor unit. So there's a cooling coil inside that unit this is the condensing unit on the roof that rejects the heat and the compressor is up here. The pipes go down through the roof and are directly connected below in the ceiling as is the interlock wiring. Uh, there's a disconnect switch here. Uh, this will be started up by our technicians this spring. We never did get to start this up because of obvious conditions, but we'll come back here and make sure this is running fine for you in the spring. This is an outside air hood. Um, that unit also has 
fresh air that has to be introduced into that lobby area. So this is the outside air hood that brings in fresh air to that unit and then it controls it either a uh, minimal amount of outside air that always comes in while that's running to get ventilation rates, but then it would open and close more or less depending on the amount of outside air that's required for the space. Um, looking back in the, in the background here, there's one exhaust fan. Uh, that's an exhaust fan for your two existing bathrooms that were existing, but again, it's a brand new fan and new ductwork below to those two existing bathrooms. That round dome hood uh, on the far end of the roof is actually the intake hood for air in the chiller room. Should the refrigerant monitoring system go off and you need to bring in fresh air to purge that room and exhaust it, there's a damper underneath that that opens up. It lets the fresh air into the room and then the exhaust fan in that room purges the uh, uh, refrigerant gas out of the chiller room. Obviously in the, in the background you can see these black intake and exhaust hoods. Those are your boiler intake flues and exhaust flues uh, for the boilers and the domestic water heater. Um, this roof, you can't see it's snow covered right now, but there was an entirely new roof put on here. Um, we put on a whole new roof membrane and a cover board over the, uh, the old uh, membrane that was taken off. The existing insulation and the roof drains all remained, but we wanted to put on a, uh, a new roofing system itself just to maintain some um, integrity of the roofing, number one, but the old roof was out of a warranty. So this now uh, entirely new flat roof has a new warranty uh, that would be furnishing to DCR for record purposes. The high roof was not done. Um, we ran this, ran this new roof all the way over and came up the high roof about four feet and to put a termination bar the full length of the barrel roof to terminate the new roof to the old roof. Um, but basically this whole new roof was done and all new edge metal around the perimeter of the roof as well. The vent pipes you see, um, some of them had to be extended up higher uh, due to code issues that the existing plumbing vents that were in the building were too close to this outside air hood, so by code we had to get them up higher. And that's why you see some of these extended up uh, a little higher than some of the other ones.